joining us. How are you doing? Well, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, like like you said, it's, it's all serious. I don't do, I, I've learned on the internet, especially on Facebook, there's no room for humor in aviation. So uh, my mission is just to stop that stuff before it starts. This is, uh, it, it's all serious. So uh, yeah, I have a, uh, those of you who, who are familiar with me, probably are familiar with me uh, through the YouTube channel that I started a handful of years back. Um, it is all satire. And one of my favorite things about the channel is people who come to it not realizing it's satire and tell me that I'm doing horribly dangerous things and irresponsible things. And I have to stop and explain to them that you're, you're probably in the wrong place if you're, if you're looking for serious stuff. So it is all, 99% uh, <clears throat> of it is, uh, is just intended to be funny and be lighthearted. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you guys' sort of initial exposure to aviation is. I, I, ever since I was a small child, I wanted to fly. And just like, I never grew up. Um, always kind of look at airplanes and aviation like a kid. Just I, even, even now I go to the airport and I can just sit there and watch Cessnas bounce down the runway all day long. Like it, I, I just love seeing planes fly. So when I got into aviation, I quickly learned that a lot of, a lot of the aviation community is a little more, um, I don't know, egocentric than I was prepared for. I sort of expected to just be in a sea of childlike minded people who are fascinated with aviation and just like tapping each other on the shoulder and going, man, this is awesome. And what I, what I kind of was met with was people going, oh, your CFI sucks. You should get a different CFI or you're doing it wrong. And it was just, especially online. Uh, and so <laughs> I don't deal with that kind of stuff though. So that's, that's kind of part of how this all sort of started for me. Um, and so it, it really started out on aviation forums and stuff. I've always been the guy who um, if someone tries to poke me, I just kind of roll with it. Um, and so uh, I was on aviation forums and people were kind of picking on each other. And I was like, well, I'm just going to be the wimp and be like, yeah, I'm terrible. I've got the worst CSI and I, I just need to keep firing them and going from the next one to the next one. Uh, started writing on a lot of aviation forums. Uh, and I would, I would take the different characters from the forums and make plays essentially out of them. And it just became this sort of thing where every week I'd put out a new story and uh I enjoyed writing. I enjoy writing satire and people enjoy reading these, these stories. And so I thought I'm going to start an aviation comedy blog and it's failed more miserably than anything else I've ever done. And so, uh, after the YouTube, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the beginning of the YouTube channel, but after the YouTube channel got rolling, I, I thought I could use the channel to draw some attention to my blog. Cause that's really where I wanted to be was writing uh, satire. And so I actually named my YouTube channel Just Plain Silly because that was the name of the blog. And the, the blog just never took off. And so I was like, well, what the heck with it? I'll just, I'll just go this other route. And so it's kind of kind of where I'm at now. So uh, if I understand, you're a, uh, your dad's a pilot as well. Is that correct? That's correct. My dad flew when I was a, a young child in the, the 80s. And uh, it's kind of, uh, he and I haven't had this conversation. I, I should ask him. So when, when I was a kid, he had a Cherokee, I think 140 that he shared with a friend. And I, I mean, every day I'd, he, I would like, maybe he'll come home and say, hey, let's go flying. Cause I just, I love, you know, the, the option to do that. But for, for whatever reason, I would never ask, but he, you know, sometimes he'd say, hey, let's go flying. There was a, a pretty scary landing with some friends on a ski trip um, in Angel Fire, New Mexico. And after that, my mom said, you know, why don't you, why don't you not do this anymore? And my dad said, okay. Um, about eight years ago, I decided I was going to take flying lessons. I, want, I wanted to take them all my life, but I kept waiting to, for it to be affordable. And finally, I was like, they're never going to be affordable. Just, just take a lesson. Um, so I took a lesson. I remember coming home uh, to my dad and showing him that shirt tail that I cut off because I soloed. And I secretly suspect, like with the next week, he was playing shopping. So I feel, like, I feel like there was probably a conversation I'm not privy to where he had with my mom that probably went something along the lines of, you know, I need to get a plane and get back in this so that I can make sure he does it right. I'm, I, I, he, he and I now fly all the time, and he loves it. But I, I don't think he would if, if I hadn't gotten into it. So uh, uh, I, I secretly suspect that he's probably wanted to do this for a while, and Mom has probably said no, but now he's got to keep me safe. <laughs> so I did not know that you skied. We've got a ton of our membership that are skiers. <laughs> I, I love to ski. We try to go, because I live in Texas, we never, well, until this year, we never get snow. And so I committed to my kids, like every year we're going to get snow one way or the other. And so we, we do a ski trip or there, it, it snowed out in West Texas a little while back. So we just drove out there because I just, I love the snow. The kids love the snow, but we're not in a good, up until this year, we've not been in a good place for it. 
Awesome. Uh, so your dad bought an airplane and he, he, uh, he's got a Cirrus. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so we, we had a little plane called a PB9 Tampico, a little weird looking French plane for a while. And uh, we, we blew the wings off of that thing. And then um, dad decided it was too slow and he needed something faster. And so um, he was looking at a TB20 or a Cirrus and finally decided, you know, something happens to him while he's flying. Um, or probably he just thought I was going to smash something into the ground and I needed it. But uh, he decided to go with the Cirrus because it has the, uh, the parachute. So far, we haven't used it. Um, and this year, I think, is our, our repack year. So I'm hoping to uh, – the, the first year Cirrus, which is the one we fly, it doesn't have a door to repack it. They actually have to take, like, a sawzall and cut a hole in the top of the back of the plane to pull that chute out and repack it and put in the, uh, the rocket engine that pulls the chute out. So it, I don't know why they didn't think we should put a door on this. Maybe they didn't know there was going to need to be a repack. But uh, I'm kind of excited to see that process. Now, is it pretty expensive to have that uh... – parachute replaced on every landing or every other landing <laughs> uh you know <laughs> i don't know i i do have the thought that when it's time to repack it we should just take it out the, the automatic way like they're gonna have to cut a hole in it anyway and they gotta throw the rocket out i think they let us try it um no i, I haven't used it uh yet knock on wood and i, I don't plan to i it, it does give me a sense of um I, I guess like like I don't fly at night as a general rule, um, and in my plane I would never my my Grumman I would never fly at night. And the Cirrus I'll go a little bit later past sunset just because I I have that there. I would never fly in you know conditions I'm not supposed to be, but I definitely have slightly different minimums uh, with with the shoot as an option. But no. <clears throat> I mean I would I wouldn't fly the Cirrus either. I mean the Grumman out out flies it anyways. It's much faster. <laughs> yeah, it's about. Uh, the, the Grumman, I think, is right at about half the speed of the Cirrus. So, uh, you know, I personally don't know how fast it goes, and I'm 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 eager to to see if you'd be willing to spill the beans on that on that speedy Grumman. On the Grumman, oh man, I don't know if I should tell you because I'm going to sell it. And Grumman pilots are notorious for saying their planes are fast because there's no rivets to slow it down. <laughs> the skins are glued on. Um, I cruise at around 110 knots in the Grumman. Um, and that's, that's true. Indicate is a little bit, a little bit slower, but if I, if, if, and when I sell the plane, I, I hope it's in a winter, like the one we just had in the middle of December, cause it, it's, uh, it's a little bit faster in the cold air, but it's, it's not speedy at all. It's, it's a, it's a Jeep. It's just fun, fun for tooling around, fly around with the canopy open kind of thing. So I'm, I'm a big fan, but family, family's outgrowing it. My son's about to be 14 and it uh, turns out they, they grow fast, they eat a lot, and the CG is getting a little aft for me. Okay, well, there you go. If folks want to buy the airplane, it's, it's, uh, it may possibly be for sale. Now, um, are you going to Oshkosh this year, Brian? I am, yes, I am absolutely going to Oshkosh. Are you flying the Grumman there? I am. <laughs> Did you hear how I said that? Like, it's so slow. Uh, it's going to be about 10 hours. Uh, so it's a, that's, that's with stopping for fuel a couple of times and stuff, but, um, I want to, I want to do one more, one more trip in my, my plane to, to Oshkosh to thank it for giving me five fun years of flying. Well, awesome. I've heard Grumman's do really well at high altitude. So, uh, <laughs> uh yeah, they're, uh, they're known for their lethargic climb at any altitude. Uh, I remember when I when I first bought it, uh, someone messaged me and said, "You're never going to get that thing off the ground in Texas." <laughs> like, what have you heard about these planes? Um, but it's funny you mentioned high altitudes because I know you guys are all in the the mountains and stuff. And so I had actually thought about going out to where you guys are at and taking a a mountain flying course. Um, but what I actually decided uh, is I'm gonna I'm gonna create my own course and it's called the Flatlanders course. <laughs> And so it's, it's a, a course for you guys to learn how to handle near sea level altitudes and how your plane performance is going to be different than what you're expecting. So um, it's also good for people who are afraid of heights because we're never going to go over about 2,000 feet. There's absolutely no need out here. That's actually pretty high. Um, the, the first, I actually have a syllabus in front of me. So the, the, the first lesson um, is how to handle boredom um, and lack of notable landmarks to figure out where you're at because there's really, really nothing to look at here. 
Um, second lesson is going to be how to spot your house. Um, every flight you go on, if you have a passenger, that's really the only thing you do is say, hey, can we go, uh, can we go look at my house? Uh, so we teach you how to do that. Um, let's see, we're going to focus on takeoffs and landings. So we, we will take off about the speed that you guys taxi. And our landings, we teach you how to perfect just floating down the whole runway. You guys have really long runways because you, you have to get up to speed to get off the ground. Uh, we just float and float and float and float. So um, that's going to be the class. Um, we'll have some uh, some advanced topics, turns around a giant pasture, how to count cattle, and um, how to handle engine outs, which here are, are great. The entire state's just like a, a giant grass runway. There's there's no, I think if you fell asleep in your plane, you probably just wake up in a field somewhere uh, pleasant. Um, I took took my friend Carl from Arizona up, and, and we took off, and he goes, Brian, it looks exactly the same in every direction. He's like, this is the worst flying I think I've ever done. He's from Sedona. And uh, so anyway. Uh, I'll be working on that class to prepare you guys for what it's like to fly out here in the, the sea level. Uh, you got to have, you got to have skill. <laughs> there you go, Marty. I think we could probably offer that at a discounted rate for for our pilots. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's got it's legally it's got to be free, but we'll talk offline about. <laughs> yes, we can arrange a small kickback if we get anybody signing up, but that may be doubtful too. So we'll see. <laughs> I well, take I that Dogecoin. Well, it's like Eastern Colorado to me. It's the same as West Texas or Central Texas, <laughs> except the hill country. <laughs> Find your way around there. It has some topography. A little bit. Yeah, we got the uh, our our hill. It's hills. They're not mountains, so uh, it's 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 so flat out here. I I I don't think that much about it, but there is like. If we ever just go up to just fly around, it's like, well, what lake should we go fly over? <laughs> just look at lakes. So most of our flying is for food. Um, but not, not a lot of scenery. So where are you based in Texas, Brian? I'm in Denton, Texas. So you know, everybody okay. says they're from Dallas. Yeah, yeah. And the follow-up question is where in Dallas, and then it's somewhere 50 miles away. But So I'm about um, a 30-minute flight from the Oklahoma border. Mm -hmm. That's that's why I don't have a Texas accent. I'm a northerner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Brian, uh, I just wanted to thank you again for taking time because I know you're usually swamped with CF with with students given your CFI schedule. Um, so naturally, I I, I think it's uh, a good time to sort of pull up. Let me just go ahead and uh, pull something up. I'm so uh, nervous. I'm so nervous. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Stand by one second. So when I reached out to Brian, uh, I had asked for his email so I could send out a Zoom link or, or some contact information. And, and this is what I got in response. And so I think it'd be awesome to sort of uh, uh, talk through it. I see you're almost one punch away from getting a free sandwich. So uh, uh, congratulations and uh, excited to kind of hear your experiences with, with the FISDO here. Uh, they just they just liked me a lot. And so I, I just did this because I want to promote them. <laughs> uh, so I make jokes on my YouTube channel, but I also make jokes at home and on Facebook. And um People don't like jokes on Facebook, it turns out. So I, um, how this started, and this is my actual business card, is I, I uh, someone was looking for a, an instructor in the North Texas area on Facebook, and I made sure that there were 30 answers before I chimed in with my silliness. I uh, should, have, should have let more answers go by, I guess. And I said, my response was, I'm happy to teach you, but I'm not actually a CFI. So you'll, it's not legal and you'll have to pay me cash under the table because I also don't want to put it on my taxes. Well, someone decided to take a screenshot of that and send it into the FAA. Uh, and so <laughs> they're required to call you. Uh, and so I got a phone call and uh, said, hey, Brian, this is your local FAA office. And immediately I thought, this, this is the best prank ever. This is my friend, Ed, who's, who's pretending he, he and I do stuff like this. I was like, he's prank calling me. And he, he got me scared. I was like, man, this is good. And then the, the guy goes, did you, did you get our email? And I thought, this is the prank. Ed's calling me, pretending to be the email. I'm going to open it up. It's going to be something obnoxious. Or Anyway, sure enough, there's an email from FAA.gov. 
saying that I have been accused of accepting money in exchange for giving flight instruction. So, uh, so I call them back and I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, maybe this will ring a bell. And they sent me a photo of the post, the screenshot that, that had been sent in. And I said, well, I said, no, that's, that's, that's a joke. Um, I, 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 I've not uh, accepted money for training anybody. I said, I don't even accept my pro rata share if you, if you go flying in my plane. I'm looking for it. They said, that's not good enough. Um, why don't you come down and bring your logbooks and bring your license and bring your medical and bring everything aviation related you have. And this is where things get interesting. And this is where I think the only one little piece of information I have that's of any value to pilots. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you guys' experience is with the FAA. Um, I've, I've, obviously, I've gone to the FISDO a couple of times. We'll, we'll finish that in a minute. I've been ramp checked before. Um, the internet has a, a, a way of, of people talking about how the FAA is kind of out to get you. And, and especially for new pilots, I think it's very scary. Um, people were calling me saying, don't bring your logbooks. One person said, no, you, you tell them to meet you at your airport. Like, I'm going to be like, no, FISDO, you come to my turf. Um, they're like, get a lawyer. Basically, don't, they say, just don't even talk to these guys because they're going to they're stop you from flying forever. And so now I'm like so scared. They're going to take everything. Um, and, um, you, you know, there's the, the FAA, we're not happy till you're not happy. And so there's this sort of fear presence, you know, that they get scared. Um, I, I just said, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I took everything down there and I could not have had a more pleasant experience in my life. And two physio visits, both ex and a rent check, Oh, very pleasant. Um, I, I went down there and I gave the guy, I said, here's my log books. And I asked him, I said, are you going to take these away? And he said, I, no, I can't legally. And why would I want your log book? I said, everyone told me you're going to take it. He said, no. And I said, what about my pilot's license? I gave him that my medicine. He goes, I can't, because if I, if I want you to quit flying, I don't need your materials to do that. I can get, you know, I can pull your cert without physically having it. Um, he said, that's not what we're in the business of doing. Um, all the FAA folks I spoke to were actually pilots. He said, our job is to find out if you screwed up and if you did screw up to get you back in, into good standing so that you can continue flying. He said, we're not here to, to I mean, so the flying situation is already kind of going downhill. He goes, we don't, we, we're not in the business of, of, of doing that. So um, we, we went there and, and he, he went through my logbook very thoroughly, every single page. And I said, do you mind talking through what you're doing? He said, well, I'm looking um, to see if you have any notes in here, like I gave instructions you know, to something or whatever. And I said, you're going to see some notes in there that are very sarcastic. Um, but um, I said, no, I, you know, I haven't given any instruction and, 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 you know, there's no dual time log or anything like that. And he said, you know, if, if we were to find your signature in someone else's log book, then we would have to reopen this case. But he goes, obviously it was a joke. We get that it's a joke. He did say we are required to investigate anything that comes across our desk. The reason being, had I been out there instructing and someone gotten hurt and they had me and said, ah, oh, we're not going to deal with this. Now they're kind of somewhat culpable. So um, it, it was extreme. And, and I, I interviewed them afterwards and I, I said, you know, do, do, do you guys uh, stop people from flying? Do you, you know, take certs away and all this? And the guy said, I think he said he'd been doing it for eight years. And he said, I, I pulled one guy's certificate for 90 days. Um, it was a 90 day pro probation. And then he had to take a remedial course for some, uh, serious, serious infraction. He said, but he said, we're not going to take your stuff. He goes, even if I told you you're, you're, you're on, you know, suspension, I'm going to give you your, your materials back. So, but that was eye opening because I went in there so scared and I came out like, I'll call them now from time to time when I have questions and, you know, they're like, Hey, Brian. <laughs> but, um, so I, I don't know if, 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 and I've been ramp checked and, and gave people all the documents on the plane and they went through them and handed back and said, have a great day. Um, so that, that's the only probably real, I think, thing I could ever impart on people, especially for younger pilots who get this sort of, oh, it's, it's, they're, they're terrible and they're, they're mean and they're trying to stop us from flying and they don't like it. My experience says that it's 100% not true. Everything else I do is a joke, but that's the one piece of information I would love to impart on any, any pilots who have ever heard that or are worried that. I, my fear is... Um, I think there are probably people out there who would be scared to declare an emergency because they think they might get in trouble. Um, I, I listened to the, the black box recordings and some of these case studies and there, there's a, a, a relatively famous serious incident in uh, DuPage. If you Google DuPage serious, you can listen to this guy on the radio and they, they basically begged this guy to declare an emergency. And I mean, so many opportunities and, and he ended up going in nose down and, and took his daughter and one of her friends with him and, and 
you know, I, I don't know what's going through his mind, but I, I know there are people who probably hesitate to do anything because they're, they're scared something's going to happen. They're going to get in trouble. Um, but I don't know. That's, that's the only serious thing I'll say today. <laughs> but hopefully if anyone's worried about the FAA or the FISDA or something, they're, they're there to help. That's my experience. So. Have you uh, asked any of their representatives to be involved in a video? Yes, I have. Boy, boy, that's the fastest you'll ever hear anybody say nope. They go, uh, we've got people you can call uh, to contact about that, and they're going to tell you no, but you're probably going to call them anyway. And so, no, absolutely not. Um, they are they are extremely by the book. Um, I kept trying to make the guy laugh. I kept going. I, I told the guy, what I do? I told the guy, I go, I almost asked if we could reschedule because I've got a student. And he didn't, he didn't even crack. <laughs> I kept um, I, I kept you know, asking him, I go, well, what, what would you do if you saw this? What would you do if you saw that? Just trying to get him to break character. Everything he said. Well, let's go to the book and see what it says. Like they're they're not there to like have fun. And I th I think I think there's a risk for them of going off script um, because they're they're scrutinized. I mean, he was the first time I went, he was training somebody, um, so it was very 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 rigorous. Um, but no, they they will not take part in. They, they both both people said keep doing what you're doing. Aviation needs the levity, but they also both said you're probably going to see us again. <laughs> Got see, gotcha. Well, I love the business card. Um, you know, naturally, the, the email is also amazing. At first, when I when I spoke to you, I thought that th that was a piece of satire, but only I learned that that's actually your real email, which is amazing. It is. <laughs> as soon as I found out that was available, I bought it. And uh, so Dan Milliken from uh, Taking Off the next day goes, well, I bought worldsokayestpilot.com. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um Let's talk about your YouTube page a little bit. I know uh, uh, over the years you've had some very innovative, innovative products that is that have helped the uh, aviation community as a whole. And so I kind of want to take this next ten minutes or so, give you an opportunity to sort of introduce those products. Uh, and I think where we should start with is I've got this this piece of avionics gear. Um, that does really well, especially at, at high end, high density altitudes. And let me go ahead. I love that we haven't rehearsed this. I'm so nervous about what you're going to bring up. <laughs> yeah, bear with me. The zoom. There yeah. we go. <laughs> so hopefully this looks familiar. Um, yeah. Brian, can you tell us a little bit more about about this this piece of equipment? Yeah, this is uh, this is state of the art stuff here. You're not going to find this at, uh, from any of Dynon, Garmin, any of those guys. And I, it's it's all proprietary. So uh, uh, this is a device called the, the Brynon uh, All-in-One. And what it does is it really replaces every instrument. Um, you, it's got uh, your altimeter. You've got an HSI. You've got uh, attitude indicator, turn coordinator, basically everything that you want. Um, it'll also play like I Love Lucy reruns and uh, Three's Company, basically all your favorite shows. Um, and it, it connects to um, another device I have that I call the Brypad. It's, it's a much larger version. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, sort of like the iPad for floor flight. Um, and uh, the, the only downside to this is in turbulence, uh, if you shake it too much, it, everything just kind of goes away. So you got to fly and only smooth weather. <laughs> yeah, is it's it, fantastic. I'm sure they'll be selling them at Oscars. Is it pretty compatible with, with autopilots or floor flight even? Oh no, nothing's compatible with four flight. Actually, they're they're a direct competitor of mine. Um, I I have a product. <laughs> it's hard to talk with a straight face. I have a product. Uh, it's uh, similar to four flight, only better, and uh, it's called five flight. Uh, and so what 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 five flight does is uh, it does everything four flight does, but also one of, one of the things is if you're a student pilot, you have to go through all of these these long cross countries and and these extended flights, but you're not you're not learning anything on a long taking off landing emergency maneuvers. So what you do is five flight will do some of these flights for you. So it will like send a text to your instructor saying, "Hey, I'm 30 miles out," or give coordinates, or say you've landed at an airport while you're at home having snacks on the couch, because um, you're not you're not learning anything on those 50 mile legs. So it, it makes it more efficient. Um, and with with five flight, we lower the minimums a little bit. We give you 500 feet of forgiveness altitude. Uh, with respect to uh, marginal and IFR minimums, because we trust you as pilots and we have more confidence in you than the FAA. So uh, yeah, it's a whole line of products that you're you're probably going to see um, all over Oshkosh. They're taking over. Um, 
And if you watch, if you, if you go to that video, Dion commented, <laughs> that's one of the first comments in there was like, we need to know who does your distribution. These look great. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, what about, yeah. I've got another one here and I keep jumping. And this one I'm really interested in. This one I, I think has some value. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, third class medical simulator. And, and yeah. Yeah. So a, a lot of people fly flight, flight simulator, which is great because that can help you with your flight, but there's no medical simulator on the market. So um, this one I worked with Microsoft on it. As you can, you can tell, uh, it says Microsoft on there. This is Microsoft third class medical simulator. And um, it, it, it comes with a bunch of tools to help you pass your, your medical. So um, what, what happened here and why there's, um, you know, confess it's blood. It, it comes with um, a, a, a little vial of clean blood and also one of clean, clean urine. Um, Cause sometimes it's your medical, they, they take blood and urine. Um, but it's got, it's got uh, some tools in there that will help you uh, pass your medical if you're struggling at certain points. Um, there's a there's a an eye chart that comes with it, and this this probably most people don't know. Uh, there's the eye chart that has the different different letters, and they always ask you like, what's the smallest line you can read? And and this this I actually kind of have a blown up eye chart. Here's the secret, guys. The very bottom smallest line it just says tomato flames, uh, and so I I kind of expand that and show you that, and I give you other tools and, and tricks to pass your medical. So it's a fantastic video. Um, I, I I only had the one copy and I sold it to a guy. So uh, but if you can if you can find it out there. It'll help you pass your medical. Do you anticipate expanding to first class and second class? I probably should. <laughs> I've never had a first class or second class medical. I should. I don't know what they entail. <laughs> I'll have to look it up, but I'm going to write that down. <laughs> well, good. So, you know, as I watch your videos, some of the one of the very first things that that comes to my mind, and especially even just looking at this photo, is how does your wife not kill you with all the all the shirts and laundry that you that you ruin? You know, from the oil so, changes. And... Yeah, yeah, she's she gets irritated at the amount of fake blood that my YouTube channel requires. Um, there was that actually that video. Uh, I mean, that's real blood. I'm not breaking character. No, so when I was doing that one, I was like mixing up corn syrup and uh, food coloring and all kinds of stuff to make the fake blood. And I don't know what happened, but in, inadvertently, it spilled all over the floor. And um, oh, it was beet juice is what it is. And you know what's hard to get out of grout? It turns out beet juice is really hard to get out of grout. And so she called me and she said, hey, I'm on the way home from work. You want me to pick anything up? And I said, why don't you go out and have wine with your girlfriends for a while? You're not going to want to come home until I get the fake blood out of the ground um she she started to get used to it because she'll she'll walk in on me and and, and I'll, I'll be up to whatever i'm up to and she's like she, she's come to terms with it now uh but early on early on i think it was a struggle for her i would come home from the airport and just be covered from head to toe in oil and blood or whatever else was coming out of the plane at that time um Oh yeah, there you go. That's that's a uh, marble mystery oil. Uh, that was that was when I discovered I have a, a slight allergy to it, and I sneezed, and wouldn't you know it, uh, that shirt never made it back to the washer again. <laughs> um, the hard part about this is you can see I'm in an open tea hanger, and uh, when I was filming that, people just drive by, and uh, it's like I, I'm not going to stop because I want to get the thing filmed. But what I find most interesting is no one stopped. Like halfway through this video, I was covered in what looked like oil and blood, and people just kind of walk, drive by, and look, and then drive on. I'm like, I would be like, sir, do you need help? But not, not at my airport in Texas. They're probably just like, just, just drive, keep driving. Oh man, there's a lot of fluids that come out of that plane. And then, of course, I've got more too as well. I know uh, um, you're really good with oil changes. Yeah, I, I teach people how to do their own maintenance on their aircraft, and so uh, this is a uh, this is me changing my oil. And uh, I, I'm not even sure exactly what the premise was for this one, but that that was actually the moment when the first person drove by, <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going with it. I got to get this over with. Um, 
No, I changed my own. And then um, I just twisted off the filter and I didn't know it was going to come out the bottom, but it uh, turns out uh, gravity. A lot of people accuse me of using um, Hershey syrup or something, but that's, uh, that's, that's 30 weight. That's a uh, benzoyl. I mean, that, so that, that, that looks nothing like chocolate syrup. No, not at all. No, didn't taste like it either. Didn't but, taste well? Was <laughs> it pretty hot? Um, I have to, I have to go back. I think last time I looked at my reaction, I sure reacted like it was hot. Um, <laughs> no, that, uh, yeah, that was, um, oh, good. We don't have to talk about that picture anymore. No, please yeah. do. I, I'm, I'm very curious. <laughs> now, it's, it's funny, like, when kids come up to me, that's always their favorite one. Like, what, what was it you poured on your face? And I'm like, it was oil. It was, that's. I didn't pour it on my face, but no, I had a, um, I had a container of Hershey's syrup up there and I, I went to go take the, the bolt off and, and I just, I just let it go. And, um, I had like six cameras going cause like, I'm only doing this once and if one of them doesn't turn out. I'm not doing it again. Uh, so yeah, that's, a that was, that was me coming home. My wife's like, what happened? I was like, don't worry. It's not oil. It's chocolate syrup. She's like, I have the same question. What happened? <laughs> Fair point. So I'm curious, as you, uh, as you develop new content, um, walk us through kind of your process. You know, how do you come up with, with these creative ideas uh, uh, to make us laugh? And, and, and how do you then transform that into a, a good video and, and do all that editing as well? So it's, it's actually a good question. It's a question I get a lot. And I, I don't ever set out to make a flying joke or a flying video something will pop in my head that I think is funny. And then I go, okay, is there a way I can make this uh, aviation centric? Um, and so like, I'll, I'll get, like I have a whiteboard and I write things down. So um, a, a friend of mine flew over, over the Grand Canyon and um, I, I can't fly over the Grand Canyon. It's far away. So I, I'm going to, I'm working on a video called a Grand Canyon flight, not the Grand Canyon flight, but a Grand Canyon because Palo Duro Canyon is only an hour away from me. And I think it's a Grand Canyon. Uh, so the premise of the video is going to be my Grand Canyon flight. Um, I, I, I'm, let me think for a second, like what else is on my my plate? Um, a, a lot of it, a lot of it comes from if, if I have something funny, I try to translate it into aviation. Or if I'm just going to do some sort of flying video, like the Cirrus stuff was just when I started flying the Cirrus, people. Um, really didn't like serious pilots and they had a lot of negative stuff to say. So I was like, well, I'm going to go make a flying video, but I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be that serious pilot that everyone thinks is just deadly stupid, has more money than sense and does everything wrong. And so I was like, the, the, the first video I made, I, I, I never intended to be a YouTuber. Um, I was on a forum called Pilots of America and, you know, the anti serious crowd was um, quite wild. And I was like, I'm just going to go land my plane and I'm just going to be the dopey I did everything wrong guy. And so I made this video called how to land a Cirrus and uh, it took off. And um, I said, okay, well, I'm going to make a video called how to take off a Cirrus. And that one did okay. And then I made a video called how to pre-flight a Cirrus, but it was all just this sort of stereotypical what the internet thinks of Cirrus pilots character. And uh, it was after that third one where I kind of thought, man, I'm probably going to end up doing this a little bit more than I planned. Cause I know I don't, I'm not super comfortable on camera. It's not my, my favorite thing. I really like to write. Um, and so I would love to write for a show and have someone else say, hey, here's my idea. Go make it. Um, but it, so I, I had a couple couple videos. And I, every time I came up with something, put a video out every every three months, whatever. And then then I meet this man named Daniel Milliken. He's got a, he's starting a YouTube channel. And he goes, hey, I'm, I know you have a YouTube channel. He goes, I'm thinking about starting one. He's like, I'm, I'm thinking about starting with one video a week and then ramping it up to two videos a week. And I'm going to do all this stuff. And I was like, whoa, what? So now I'm doing one video a week, sometimes two videos a week. <laughs> um, and so after talking to him and learning a little bit more about editing and video production and stuff, not on his scale, um, I've, I've learned to do things a little bit faster and, and, and try to be more consistent. Um, cause I, I like having the channel. I like, um, the, the biggest thing for me is getting to meet people. Uh, I have gotten to meet so many amazing people 
because of these silly videos that I make that I, I mean, you know, I, I got to go out and do uh, aerobatics over the summer with, with Spencer Suderman and Patty Wagstaff was like, Hey, Brian. And I was like, that's really weird. Like, I know you, you shouldn't know me. Um, and, and that, that, that happens. And it's, so that, that's like, there's really not, I mean, if you're Josh Flowers or Flight Shops, you can make money at this, but um, that's not on my horizon. Um, but getting, getting to just, you know, and, and, and kids, that's one. I try to be very PG-13 or even a little bit less on my channel because there are a lot of kids that watch my channel because they think like the oil and stuff's really funny. Um, anything where I hurt myself uh, is really funny. And so like the, um, I went to an event in um, Kansas City over the summer and these, these kids were just, just amazing. And they were like, hey, we wanted to come shake your hand and we sign our shirt. And I was like, let's go fly. Like I, and and this, this one little girl was like, she's like, I can't believe I'm in the plane with my favorite YouTuber. And I was like, that's the weirdest feeling ever, but I love that I was able to be able to give something to her, you know, and, and this, this other little boy, same thing. And uh, he's like, don't, don't tell Josh Flowers, but you're my favorite YouTuber. And I was like, I am texting Josh right now. <laughs> um, so it's, it's that, that's, that's the best part of all of this. Um, and then, then getting to do things like this, like this is, I think this is so nice of you to call me up and ask me to be a part of this. And you, you guys let, listen to me ramble on about stupid stuff. Um, it's, it's so much fun, just the, the people side of it. And like I said, when I came into aviation, my, what I was kind of confronted with was sort of this harsh side. And, but it's like getting to sort of do things like this, like the people I meet are on, not online, but if I, it's in, in real life, people are fantastic. Everybody I've met in person is fantastic. Doing stuff like this is fun. So I, I really like being able to engage. And so the channel has been a, a huge tool for me to be able to sort of network and form relationships with people that I can, I can do things like this. This is fun for me. So I hope you guys are having some fun too. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of uh, uh, leads into a good time to, to see if folks online have questions. So everything's sort of fair and open. Uh, I wanted oh, yeah. an opportunity to have others ask some questions. So, so please, if, if you've got a question, feel free to unmute and, and, and ask, ask away. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> And if there is none, I did also have a, a uh, um, for Brian, I had a question for you because here in, here in the Rocky Mountain region, we do, I, get, I wouldn't say we experience it more frequently, but we've got, uh, we're at higher risk for carburetor icing. Um, and one of your videos suggested a solution. Uh, and I thought it'd be very, very educational to kind of talk, talk through that uh, for, you know, for this particular audience. So yeah. I think let's, here we go. Now we have a visual to sort of talk to. Yeah. So a lot of people aren't aware that you can, you can uh, uh, eliminate carburetor icing by turning on the carb heat, but a lot of planes like the Grumman, they come retrofitted with a sensor on the bottom. Uh, and so in this particular video, I'm just demonstrating uh, holding the glass under there and then the ice just uh, comes pouring out of the bottom of the plane. And then uh, you can fill it with whatever beverage you like and have a drink after your, after your flight. So uh <laughs> That was a, I was doing a series on quick tips, <laughs> quick tips for pilots. And this was, I was doing little two minute videos. And I think a lot of people aren't aware of this, this sensor that will get the carburetor ice uh, out of the bottom of your cowl. I mean, I will say it's uh, saved me a couple times. So I, I, I want to oh, personally yeah. thank you. That kind of leads to a question <laughs> I had, if I can throw one in. <clears throat> I mean, how do you, satire can be pretty hard to bring across. I mean, sometimes... Do you get people angrily contacting you about something that you did totally in jest and they just kind of didn't get it? Or, you know, is that I, or sometimes or not really? I, I do. Um, and um, I'll give you a good example. And um, I, I have a video, it's 10 seconds long. And it's me teaching you how to polish the spinner on your airplane. But in my video, the engine's running. And so I did, <laughs> um, I will tell you guys, uh, I just filmed the, I put a, a camera on the wing and just filmed the plane sitting there running with me at the controls, obviously. And then I turned the plane off and I filmed myself. There we go. Film myself polishing the spinner while the engine was not running. Uh, and then I spliced the two pieces together 
And um, so in the video, there's me polishing the spinner and the propeller spinning wildly, and which you can't tell is I'm actually in the plane dust down. Um, I ended up on the OSHA Facebook page uh, as a, a disclaimer of how this is a terrible thing to do. I, the, the most recent comment I think I've had on my channel was someone telling me how dangerous and irresponsible this is. Um, and I'm, I'm going to encourage people to do this and they're going to get killed. Um, and I, you know, I, I explained to the guy, like, if you look at the shadow of my legs right there, they don't go all the way up. <laughs> like, if I had actually been polishing the spinner, my legs probably in real life wouldn't go all the way up. Um, so, you know, but what's funny is usually I explain it to people and they'll go, okay, okay, I get it now. But some, some people will come to my channel, like, and they don't realize it's a satire. They're Googling, like, how to do things. And YouTube is a very prolific search engine now. Um, and so I, I, I've had that. Um, I recently did a video on ra radio communication, but it was all basically all the things you can do to get out of having to deal with air traffic control. Um, and, and someone just lashed out at me in the comments. And, um, you know, I, I tried to explain like, this is, this is satire. The channel is actually called just plain silly. All these videos are, are, are comical. Um, but I, I don't, I don't get upset. I usually, if it's a mean, hateful comment, like some people, some people are, are bad. Um, I'll just pin it to the top of the comments and my, my, my subscribers will usually deal with them. Um, but um, I, I've, I've had some bad ones. And then again, everyone's entitled to their opinion. It doesn't bother me. If someone thinks this is a horrible thing to put out there, I'm like, I, okay. Um, but I, I have, um, <laughs> this won't surprise you. I have two aviation attorneys that I speak to frequently. And um, I was going to do, I did a video last year um, called how, how to Fly Over the Super Bowl. And uh, I was teaching you that the TFR was there to protect you. So you could fly in circles around the Super Bowl and film the halftime show. But I, I, I called the aviation attorney and I said, how much trouble can I get into for this? His comment was, well, a reasonable person would have to believe that what you were doing is instructing people that this is the right thing to do. And a pilot who has an instructor and knows the rules would be dumb enough to think that this was legitimate and then go do it. He goes, nobody's going to go fly through a TFR over the Super Bowl and do it. <laughs> but then he, my, my attorney always says the same thing, but he goes, I could sue you right now because I don't like your shirt. Because uh, we could sue you for anything. But um, so, yeah, I, I get a little bit. I would say 99% of the, the feedback is people get it. They understand. They think it's funny. 1% of people come in confused and get mad. And I talk to them and they go, okay, I get it. And they, a lot of times they'll say, hey, I subscribe. I'm going to go dig through stuff. There are some people who just, they're like, you're the worst thing in aviation and you need to be stopped. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, if I, if, I, if I found out that you were flying around in the Super Bowl, uh, I'd, I'd be concerned that you were going to run into the blimp. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, in the video, I explained it. <laughs> no, I explained in the, in the uh, video that the, uh, these F-16s are going to be in there to escort you around safely. So uh, you'll you'll have spotters watching out for you, um, and uh, the the frequency is one twenty one point five, so that you can uh, communicate with other pilots over the Super Bowl. <laughs> <So. laughs> I've got a question, but it's going to have to wait a minute. Patey just dropped the video. Okay. With that said, um... <laughs> Brian must not have heard that. That was from his radio communications. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was one of the excuses uh, you give to to FAA or on or yeah the. Oh, the oh, 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 I'm sorry. So this this is something I always tell people. Oh my God, I'm I'm I make jokes, but I don't get them. So like I really I now know what you just did, and I apologize for being so dim when it. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> I have to explain your joke to you. <laughs> people, yeah, yeah, I know. People tell me jokes all the time, and I'm like, I was. I was pre-flighting the Sears one day and some guy drives by and goes, check for the dudes. And I was like, what? And it took me like a minute. And I was like, oh, yeah. I said, it's like, so I, again, I, I put it out there, but I, I, I need a decoder ring for, for decoding satire when it comes the other direction. This was a fantastic accident that happened to me. Um, I needed to get fuel. And the pump at my airport was down. And so I flew over to Alliance Airport, which is uh, about four miles west, southwest of me. And uh, I go to land. And uh, 
this uh, sweet, sweet lady on the tower says, uh, hey, there's a, there's a, a flight of two F-18s about to take off. Um, so you can land on a one six left, one eight left. I said, okay. And then she told the F-18, she goes, oh, you guys can take off, but there's a tiny little Grumman about to land on the other other runway. And the F-18 guy, as I'm uh, flaring, he's like, oh, it's a, it's a great looking tiny little Grumman. And then so in the video, I had my camera rolling just as luck would have it. And uh, so in the video, I said, all right, we're going to race from the F-18. These guys, I mean, blew past, of course, if it could have been a Cessna, it would have blown past the Grumman's not fast, but they blew past me. And I mean, they, they give me the ring wing rock and it was, I mean, just an accident. And so I, I put this little one minute video up on my channel and uh, these people wrote this story about it, talking about the aviation community and how, whether you're flying commercial, or you're flying uh, these little GA planes or you're flying fighters, the, the, the bond between pilots. And it was a really neat, neat write up. And so uh, I, I thought that was kind of cool. That was, that's one of the coolest things I think um, and just a complete accident um, that that happened to me. Those guys were so cool. I, I want to um, I, I wanted to like try to find them and see if we could form up in the, the series or something. I, I don't know what the rules are with those guys, but uh, that was awesome. That was awesome. wasn't It wasn't funny. It was just fun. Yeah, this is a story I did not know about. So so you've had some experience with with military jets. Yeah, and I should have just gone with that. I busted the TFR, and this was my escort. I don't know why I didn't think to go that route. <laughs> hindsight those hornet pilots probably uh, uh understood that the grumman's the same manufacturer that did the f-14 so they they understand the uh greatness where greatness is due yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's like we're flying the same plane it, it really <laughs> is and it's for sale folks so, so. it's Maybe. i think i think in, in, i'm gonna fly to oshkosh and i'm i'm Oh, it's going to be hard, but I think I'm going to put a for sale sign on it. It's such, it's just not a practical plane anymore. It makes me very sad. I love that plane. So Brian, uh, so what's, uh, what's next? What do you have up your sleeve coming up in the, in the next few months? Uh, can you give us a little sneak peek on what you're thinking? <laughs> yeah, I'm working on a couple things. So, so right now I'm working on a video. They sound so stupid when I talk about it and they are. Um, it's a device that helps you. Um, so I don't know if you've ever been flying over the pattern, trying to find the windsock so you can determine which runway to use. I've invented a little windsock that just mounts to your wing so that no matter how you land, you're always landing right into the wind. Uh, no more crosswinds, no more anything. So um, I've got it halfway filmed. Um, I, I have it mounted to the wing. It's so hard to like not just <laughs> give you guys like how it's done. Um, but uh, so I, I'm working on the video where I'm flying over talking. It's kind of infomercial style. Like, has this ever happened to you? And it's the confused pilot. And then I've got uh, the windsock on the wing while I'm flying, green screen. Um, and then for people who have bad vision, I got a little one that mounts on the dash and there's a little fan there that blows it. So you know that no matter what you do, you're always going into the wind. So uh, that's probably two weeks out. Um, and then I'm going to a fly-in in Kentucky. Uh, I'm going to meet up with, I think Martin Polly's going. I think 310 Pilot is going. So there's, we usually get together and have some some shenanigans. Um, I'm about to go do some paramotoring. I've never done that before. I've always been fascinated by it. Um, if you guys are familiar with Tucker Gott, I, I could watch that guy's paramotor videos all day long. It, it looks like so much fun. I haven't figured out what satire I'm going to wrap it in. Um, Let's see. I've got a I've got a whole list of things that I've been working on. I've got a bad habit of, of starting like four or five videos and then figuring out which one I'm most interested in continuing. Um, so I've got a lot of, of of ones that are started. And then um, prior to Oshkosh, there's a event. Um, it's the Aviation Content Creator Awards where they have this is a, if you're familiar with Dan Grider's work, a very polarizing character. Uh, but he put on this this uh, event in Kansas over the summer, and he's doing it the weekend before Oshkosh at the uh, to field just south of, of Oshkosh. So there'll be a lot of uh, YouTube stuff going on there, and then Oshkosh. So I think I'm I think I'm, I've got something coming out every other week uh, through Oshkosh, um, and I've got a little whiteboard that's got about every time I come up with an idea, I either put it in my phone or I put it on my whiteboard, and uh, I've got a sometimes my dogs will chime in, but um, I don't, I don't know what other like super funny things I have. I, I've got a folder I could look in. I've, I know I've got four or five things on the, on the, in the queue. But. 
Well, that's awesome. So, and I'm working on, working on my instrument rating. So that's, uh, I've been working on it for four years now. So uh, I, I took the test and they decided I wasn't interested. And then uh, the test expired. And then someone was like, you should really finish it. And so I went and took the test again. And I was like, well, if I'm taking the test twice, I'm finishing the rating. And so I, my check right, I think, is going to be in June. We're working that out right now. And uh, if I get the instrument, then I'll probably go ahead and get the commercial and then just roll with it. Uh, eventually, I'd, I think I'd like to, get, like to get my CFI. Uh, I think it'd be fun to teach. Um, but the problem is I have this dilemma. If I am a CFI, do I have to quit making joke videos? Because now I'm literally legally giving bad advice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but but you've got Rod Rod Machado out there that uh, kind of does the same thing. He tells funny jokes. That's true. That's true. Rod Rod's funny as heck, and so uh, also the Kings. I think humor was a big part of their their stuff, and that's that's actually one of the things I liked about you know my private. I got well, I I do what a lot of pilots do. I don't know how you guys did it, but I just kind of picked bits and pieces of each of them. I had the Glam course, and then it was just like, okay, I can just read all these PDFs or these people are cracking dad jokes over here. So I'll go with the dad joke guys. And even now I'm on a taxiway. I'm like, black square, you're there. Like eight years later, whatever he rattled off in that first video I watched is still in my head. So I don't know. I, well, I had this, this idea. Go ahead. I was going to say you did, the, you did one video where you did airspace and that was borderline educational. That, that, that is the number one video people ask me about when they meet me in person aside from the children and the, the oil the airspace video is one that continues and it's again same thing there was someone on the forum that said i'm struggling with airspace and i said yeah i did too so i came up with this thing and he goes we'll make a video about it and i said okay so i put that together and that it's like if you get on youtube and say you know air airspace explained or whatever mine's like top one top two so um and a, I wrapped it in junk. So like the first five minutes is crap that you can just fast forward through. And the rest of it is, is what I really use to memorize airspace. And it's, I mean, I, I, I looked at all the videos and all the, I love Rod Machado, but that triangle thing, that pyramid, I, I couldn't memorize it, um, any of those things. And so I, I just had this thing I threw together that, I, you know, I can do it freehand now. So made a video about it. And, and um, I, was at, I was at Oshkosh and someone came up to me and someone goes, hey, are you that guy? And I go, I don't know what guy you're asking about. And he goes, the guy who teaches airspace. And I said, no, but yes. Like, that's not where <laughs> I thought you were going with this. He goes, he goes, that helped me so much. And I was like, man, that, that means a lot. That, that kind of made me want to like, I should get my, uh, I, I, I literally thought about getting my ground instructor and then putting together a video flying course and just selling it for like 20 bucks and undercutting everybody. <laughs> Um, but then I started looking at what it would take to put it together and, and, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm just not going to put that, that much effort into, into it, but if, if there's anything I can do where there's a tip or trick or something, um, especially going through this instrument stuff, what a, what a fire hose, uh, this, this learning is, and I'm, I'm not a quick learner. Um, so I really do have to come up with my own mnemonics and my own stuff. So, uh, I don't know, there, there may be at the end of this instrument rating, there may, there may be some other semi-serious videos where I explain how I'm getting through some things that are pretty challenging, but uh, the airspace one seems to have resonated with a lot. If you, if you go to that video, read the comments, like all, most of the comments are, I've been an instructor for 20 years and this resonates with me. I'm going to start showing my students or, you know, they're, they're all so kind that the, the comments, it, it, it just floors me. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of that video. I'll say that. Hey, Brian, did you ever do anything with icing? Uh, so <laughs> not, not really, um, I, I do often tell my wife what I'm going to do. And based on how far back her eyes go in her head, when she rolls them, I determine if it's a good or a bad idea. Um, and, and there's, there's one quick clip. So my wife had gone out of town and so I, I still have the list, even though they're bad ideas. And so real quickly, we're just going to go through everything my wife said was a bad idea. And so I picked up a little bit of icing on the last flight. And of course I had the Duncan Hine. <laughs> But uh, I, I need to learn more, learn more about it. Uh, and it's probably something new. I, I got something for you here. I flew into uh, Kalamazoo one night and it had been snowing for several days and they had snow piled up along the side of the runway and it was really dark and, and I was in a Mooney and you don't get any, this only had a light in the front. So I ran, unbeknownst to me, I ran the wingtip through a big pile of snow 
and I taxi up to the FBO and there's a big pile of snow sitting on the end of the wingtip. <laughs> I looked at it and I went inside and say, told the guys I ran into a little bit of icing on the way down and <laughs> look at my plane. <laughs> So that might be a good one for you. <laughs> if, we, if we were in a snowstorm, I'm going to do that. But when it comes out of the, there's going to, it's going to be a snowman. It's going to be like a fully formed snowman on the wing. <laughs> <laughs> you may see that one next winter. Okay. <laughs> uh, well. <laughs> I, I grabbed a bag of ice at the Oshkosh one year and tossed it on the wing and posted it on Facebook and said the icing was really bad coming in. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a friend who flies in Alaska, uh, and I mean, a lot of a lot of scary stuff up there. And so uh, he and his his buddy had a ritual. So they they landed, and I didn't know that your propeller and your spinner, everything picked up ice, not just the wings and tail. I had no idea. Um, and so he, there's a big uh, chunk of ice on his spinner, and so they took it off and broke it in half and put it in a glass and poured whiskey over it and drank their whiskey with this ice, which had to be filthy. Uh, but <laughs> Oh, I thought that was yeah, that, fascinating. Take the ice playing the music for a drink. A, a leaky well, spinner with oil spinner. coming out of it. You gave him a method to clean his spinner before he used that ice brand, so it was okay. There you go. <laughs> you mentioned the Kings. If you've ever seen their presentation at Oscars, they really do a very funny presentation about their history in aviation. And yeah, so they're, they can be a little funny as well as serious. So. I met I met them at an AOPA summit and um it was so first off, I'm like a giant. Everybody's like a giant compared to them. Like they're they're like the, just the cutest and there's a picture of me and I'm not tall, but there's a picture of me standing next to them and it looks like I'm, I'm towering over them. They are the same if you guys have met them or, or, or talked to them, the same in person as they are on stage and in their videos. I mean it it, it never stops. Like he's got a quip for, for everything. And, and they, they told their stories. If you guys have heard the, the, the two stories, um, one about the time they were in IMC and I think they lost their instruments and they basically crossed their fingers and put it down in the snow. And, and, and I think they got knocked around pretty good. And then um, also about the, uh, the, the drug plane, I guess hadn't, hadn't been re-registered or whatever. And they got pulled out at gunpoint. Uh, there, if you ever get a chance to see them, they, they are very good storytellers, very good storytellers. I like those guys. <clears throat> My gold still sponsor isn't in this meeting, is it? I shouldn't be talking about other flying <laughs> courses. Right. Well, awesome, uh, guys. Um, Brian, thank you. Thank you so much. I know we're, we're right about a uh, uh, time. So I just want to thank you again on behalf of the Colorado Pilot Association for your time. This was a lot of fun. Um, please come out here and do a mountain flying course with us. And, and, and I can then promise we'll come out there and do your Flatlanders course so we can swap. <laughs> I will take you up on that. I have added it to my list. Um, I, have, I have no idea how mountain flying works. Um, I was talking to, at, at the Kansas City event, the Pateys were there. And Mike and Mark and their wives flew in in a series and they were talking about flying through the mountains. And the things they were describing was very normal to them, but it sounded so terrifying. Um, and I was, I was fascinated. And so I was like, I want to go. I, I, I'm not sure how much I want to experience it. Like it sounds terrifying, but I mean, they were 100% in control of what they were doing, but I want to learn more about it. I think I'd like to go out and I, I don't, I don't, they, some of the things they were describing sounded like a lot of riding the wind down, riding the wind up kind of thing. Um, I, I have on my list to go out and at some point go on a ride with someone who's experienced at doing that or, or take a course. Um, and I, I don't know if entry to mountain flying at Colorado is, is a, a, the best place to do it, or if you want to start with smaller mountains somewhere else, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that, you've taken the courses, right? I, I have. Yeah. Quite a few of us have. Yeah. I have to. I would say it's a better place to study mountain flying than, say, you know, Florida or someplace. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally, the town south of me is called Flower Mound, and people come to see the Flower Mound. And like, this is like the tallest structure, <laughs> like half a hill. But uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up and learn more about it. And I'll ask you guys is there a, um, a time of year that's better or worse for it? 
Uh, right now it's great. It's, you know, heavy snow and uh, visibility is almost nothing. Okay, so I'm picking up on the sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you can't see the mountains, they won't scare you. <laughs> oh, well, we have these, get a pressurized plane and just pop up to 18,000 and fly straight over them. That's a, we have no use of America. We have you've, seen the far, you've seen the far side where uh, the pilot says, hey, what's that mountain goat doing up here in the clouds? I love that one. <laughs> yes. oh, uh, so I'll, the mountain... I'll the mountain flying course is in August this year, um, and the way it works is uh, uh, the Saturday class is, and actually I think Bill, I thought I thought I saw Bill online here, um, or Bill Standard for it's, it is a, It is a Saturday ground school all day on the 29th yeah. of August. Yep, and then if you wanted to, you can arrange a, uh, a flying course or a flying session with the mountain, uh, uh, one of the CPA approved mountain flying instructors. Um, and I mean, you wouldn't be able to do it in the Grumman, but uh, I'm sure if you were planning on coming out, you might be able to arrange. You can do it in the Grumman. I've done it in a light oh, yeah. sport. It's not 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 great, but um, uh, yeah, you want something that's got a little bit of beef to it. But there's some really cool mm -hmm. things that you can do. And, uh, you know, Brian, you know, when you go out and do the steep turns out in the flatlands, um, oh. one of the things that they'll do is do steep turns between two mountain peak or two canyon peaks so you're actually eye level with the ground on on the peak on each side and you see what yeah. uh, like a, a turn is within a box canyon if you're you know so you get a sense of how fast that space closes up very quickly um that sounds I, I, terrifying it, it's a little um ah. but the thing is is you learn the the you know, speed and control when you're doing those types of turns. So, so you guys know about holding the speed and all that kind of stuff. The what? Sorry. So, so you guys know about like I was recently reading about cornering speed, like the 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 best speed at which you can turn the tightest without stressing an aircraft or pulling too many yeah. g's. Like, okay, yeah, yeah we. we um, but yeah, I mean, that yeah. was the first time that I'd ever done turns like that, where I could, I was canyon top to canyon top, and I was at eye level with that. And it, I looked at the instructor and was like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. He's like, no, no, it's okay. We can do this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if, if, I, if I do it, uh, I'll definitely commercial out there and, and fly with somebody in their plane that they're experienced. Like, I, probably the series would work, but I, I, I would rather be in someone else's in, in that environment and someone else's playing where they've got a control and experience and all that stuff. Yeah, there's quite a few people I'm sure on this call alone that would be more than happy to help you out with, uh, you know, some type of aircraft to help with that. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get the details from Dominic and then uh, I, I don't think I have anything going on at the second half of summer. So I, I may actually be able to swing that um, this year. Yeah, it's, uh, let me look at the calendar. And then you guys will get the video of me just crying <laughs> in a plane. Well, you get to land in the highest public airport in North America. So that's something. That's Leadville, right? That says I landed Leadville. in uh, Leadville. It's almost 10. What's the altitude? 98, 60 or something? 9934. 9934, okay. <laughs> That's the highest. That, that's the highest I've ever been in a GA plane. Ten five. So you guys are landing it. <laughs> so it's August twenty eighth. Oh, twenty eighth. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I think I'm flying the 29th. That's what. That's right. Okay. It's a really good. It's a really good program. Um, uh, the only downside that I found with it was uh, you spend the first half of the day going over. Uh, weather and everything in the mountains and you walk out at lunchtime going why am i flying this is really dangerous so yeah but it's i mean it's education is what you need on it to, to do it safely the environment is interesting in colorado we mow grass at five thousand feet and a lot of ga pilots have never been above five thousand feet yeah most like of just that. the front most of the front range traffic here is uh between 8,000 and 9,000 feet when you're going north and south uh, around the Denver area. 
rule of thumb for the summer is that uh, temperature in Fahrenheit is altitude density wise in hundreds. So 80 degrees is 8,000 density altitude on the ground. And how hot does it get like the hottest time of year? 90, 90 95. So are, yeah, are there it, times where you, your plane won't perform enough to even go flying? It depends on the airplane. You don't see a lot of 150s flying around out here. Okay. Because my, if, I mean, if you pick your day and you're patient with the uh, technique, you can. I, I learned to fly in the mountains, believe it or not, in an air coop. Did you really? Yep. And my Cessna 140 I, regularly goes to Leadville and Telluride. Cessna 140. You just have to be sure to fly very early in the morning. That's right. Yeah, okay. Early in the morning, going and coming back. <laughs> Yeah, because it would stink if you took off from Leadville to go somewhere and you couldn't get back home because it's too high. <laughs> well, it, it's like uh, I've flown my uh, when I was flying light sport, I, I took that up to Leadville and we left when the sun was cresting the horizon and landed before the FBO opened uh, in the FBO is where you get your certificate of uh, flying. In. It's a really nice certificate, um, but it's like standing around waiting for the FBO to open. You can almost feel the density altitude just climbing as you're there and when you take off, I mean, his, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's his certificate. Certificate. <laughs> yep. um, but it's, it's a, it's a fun flight. Um, the, the Leadville's a, yeah, you gotta be careful, but it's good. You keep well, I'm, it, I'm definitely so gonna why do, isn't the plane gonna... slowing down? You know, you're trying to go down on downwind and it's like, oh. I not put the gear down. Why isn't the plane slowing down? <laughs> well, and I kind of want to experience, like, you know, your your ground speed has got to be double what what mine is on the same day at that altitude to get that plane off the ground. Like, I I I, don't, I need to experience it because I imagine I would have a sense of like we're running out of runway, we're running out of runway, we need to get off the ground. Like, because well, it's, it's interesting because so really so learning to fly up here, um, it's not common to be at one end of the runway and not be able to see the other end of the runway. So the very first time that I flew south or, you know, further downstream, um, I remember sitting at one end of the runway and being able to very clearly see the other end of the runway and getting concerned because it's like, well, wait a minute, this runway is really short. But, you know, uh, you know, you did the wheelie video and uh, yeah. DIA's got runways that are 15,000 feet long. But uh rocky mountain metro over here uh where i fly out of has uh i think it's 8500 or 80 uh, like 9000 feet and that's the long runway so it's about a mile and okay. a half where's this where's the 16000 foot runway i want to beat that guy's record <laughs> uh yeah you need to well it's dia so you'd have to get uh, clearance into bravo now you can that's fly fine. I got land for about 50 dollar landing fee you can land in yeah. So I, I made that video where I did where I, I did that wheelie and like three weeks later that guy did a video where Guinness is there and he got the world record and I was like oh, what yes. idea man <laughs> so I, I, I did a I forget how many feet I did I was my goal was just to do a mile but he did a little under two miles I think so but so now I want to go find a dry lake bed in Nevada somewhere and just go for a day <laughs> wheelie for an hour no, I, I want to come out there and do it, especially if you get a certificate. I'll do anything for a certificate or a t-shirt. <laughs> Hang out on my wall. So I'll, um, I need to put Leadville on my bucket list. I got to look at, that's something I would, I, would, I mean, with the Cirrus, I would, I would probably not hesitate, but I would, I would want an instructor with me, I think. Um, I, just, I just never experienced that. But it's not talked about really often, but what, one of the cool things is, is you could fly from Leadville, which is the highest runway in North America to Death Valley, which is below sea level in the same day. Really? Yep. These are the kind of things I want to do. Yeah, I mean, I I, 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 that's on my bucket list to do. Especially in a Cirrus, maybe not, maybe not in a very slow plane. Not in a Cub. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to start researching Colorado. We took my family there for the first time this summer and it was it was hard not to start looking at houses. It, we we were in um, 
Colorado Springs, like Garden of the Gods kind of area. We, I mean, there's nothing here to see. And it was like, we're just eating dinner. I'm like, look, there's mountains. And I don't, I don't know if living there, if you start taking that kind of stuff for granted or anything. But I mean, everywhere we went, it was just like a picture. I was like, man, I really want, want to live here. And so we, 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 we talk about when the kids get out of the house here in a couple of years, we may <laughs> enjoy college. See ya. Um, it, I'm it's sorry, Brian. I don't, I don't know if you Brian, sorry, but we're all full up. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in Colorado sells their airplanes. I heard Brian's flying now. I'm done. <laughs> well, I'll do I'll do some research and I'll be in touch with uh, probably some of you guys because I want to um, I want to do the I want to see the mountain flying thing and then the, the Leadville thing sounds really interesting to me. So especially around here, nobody, nobody. Everybody here's like 25. Like we don't deal with atmospheric rules because everyone's under 3,000 feet. Like just planes going in any direction. So um, I don't well, know. It'll it's, be interesting. It, it's funny because I when I fly back east, uh, I'll stop in some airports in Nebraska, and you go into the FBO, and it's like density altitude. Be really careful. And I'm just sort of like, really? <laughs> here? <laughs> okay. Yeah. We we have that conversation like density altitude three thousand feet. <laughs> sure, it's safe. <laughs> and I bet you in the in, I mean your your winter time has to get extremely cold, so you probably have the opposite as well, right? You get negative well, density altitudes. Well, what's I, I I like to keep track of it just as a, a fun thing, um, and it's pretty cool right now. So we'll look and see what Metro is. Uh, and Brian, just for your information, the uh, what Leadville's standard temperature is 23 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're anything over 23, you're getting density altitude. 23 degrees Fahrenheit. That's right. You know, with elevation, standard temperature goes down. So yeah. one of the things we teach. If the snow is so melting in Leadville, you, you have a density altitude problem. So as, as it stands right now, uh, today is uh, Monday, April 19th, when we're recording this. Um, so the, el the station elevation at Rocky Mountain Metro is 5673. The density altitude currently is 4728. So it's almost okay. 1,000 feet lower at Rocky Mountain Metro. That's interesting. OK. Yeah, this is a whole, that's a whole different. Our, our stuff doesn't fluctuate that much. Uh, over the, when the snowpocalypse thing was happening, uh, it was the first time I uh, heard density altitudes in the negatives before. So, uh, but all the airports were closed, you couldn't fly. So, but, yeah, we're, my air, airport that I fly out is 600 feet above sea level. So we, our, our planes are all kind of standard day performance. We get book numbers. <laughs> so you guys probably don't ever get those. <laughs> yeah, not here, nope. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you already knock off, uh, was it uh, 3% uh, 3 horsepower for every 1,000 feet? And we're already at uh, almost 6,000 feet. So uh, you've already lost 18% of your horsepower just just for nothing on a standard uh, or, non, or normally, normally aspirated engine. Okay. But, but let me ask this, because if, you're, if your density altitude, if, if, it's, if it's much less dense, you're physically moving like you're is your ground speed just incredible i think you get used to it um, okay. i mean oh. you know, i don't i don't think about it much i mean i just look at the airspeed indicator when i'm taking off make sure that i hit my the numbers when the airplane's supposed to fly and then it flies no i just wondered if a 172 on a, a day with no wind out there does 150 knots over the ground or, or you know i don't know what what the difference is in speed wise? How do you it's not that much. Well, I okay. mean, also keep keep in mind that uh, you know 172 is going to be a naturally aspirated engine. You're going to take off and be at seven or eight thousand feet, and then you've already lost the percentage of horsepower due to your altitude True. already. So, you know, you've lost that that much in that that period of time. Sometimes the cub. Okay. Is, sometimes the cub is over 80 miles an hour of ground speed up here. <laughs> Speed I've never flown a cub before. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I will. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna add some of that stuff to my bucket list because it's uh, fascinating to me. It sounds scary, but um, 
as long as I'm in good hands, I'm happy to, to go out there and try it. Cool. Well, we'd love to have you. Cool. So, uh, hello, my name is Joshua McVay. Uh, I, uh, this is one of my first meetings with you guys. And uh, I just want to let you uh, know that I, uh, I fly a, uh, a modified uh, Cessna 150. Wow. That uh, has a stole cup on it that uh, has 160 horsepower um, Lycoming 0320 on it with bush wheels with a cup and um, install fences. And I just want to let you guys know that uh, it is possible with density altitude um, that, uh, you know, at, at, at 80 to 90 uh, degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit outside that I can still land my airplane um, right around uh, it, it lands at 38 miles an hour. Um, wow. Um, and it's indicating 60. <laughs> so, I mean, it, there, there is some serious things that go on with density altitude. And yeah, I, I might be doing 80 miles an hour. Um, but you know, it's indicating on the wing that it's 38 miles an hour. That's that's crazy. Yeah, so I. So you just the, the only. Hello. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, so you could just slow down and let your passengers hop out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, mean, if, if, I, I I fly out of BDU. Um, oh, okay. Don Dulcy um, is on this call as well, and. I, I actually texted him and said, hey, by the way, do you think I should say something like this? And he's like, yeah, go for it. Um, but yeah, it, it all depends on how comfort, uh, comfortable you are with your airplane and knowing your limits um, on what you can actually do. So I don't land my airplane at 38 miles an hour. I mean, it, it, the wing falls off at 38 miles an hour. And whether yeah. I'm like six feet up or 10 feet up, because I have 26 inch bush wheels on it, um, on the Cessna 150, you can actually, you know, you can pound it into the ground. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for anybody with uh, five and a half inches because uh, the, um, the firewall is gonna wrinkle. But, yeah. you know, we, we've, I, I've made this airplane in such a way that um, you can actually do these things to, do, uh, to practice that. And so knowing that you have so much drag, so much um, um, density altitude, um, whether it's 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 100 degrees, um, knowing how the airplane is gonna fly um, in those different conditions and how much buffer that you're gonna have you know, on landing is, is, is very, very crucial. And I think I'll just stop my Conversation with that. It's good info. <laughs> it is. That's and again, out, out here, it's, it's it's not even not not even something we think about. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, adding these things to my bucket list. Awesome. So, so uh, anyways, um, I'll, I'll just throw one more other thing out there. Is uh, if you want to look at my airplane. Uh, I think it is on flight aware. Um, the the end number is uh, November three six nine zero Juliet. All right, I wrote that down. I'm gonna check it out. Where do you fly out of, Josh? Um, I, I I fly out of uh, out of Boulder or BDU. I put it in the chat for everybody. And I, I'm more than happy to, uh, to take people up and uh, let them know uh, some of the things that I've done to, to my airplane to uh, help them. Um, you know, I, I know airplane cost is very, very expensive. Um, and I just wanna let you guys know that I'm a maintenance guy for the city of Boulder. And uh, my passion was, um, you know, being able to be a pilot. And um, I was able to make that happen after my kids uh, um, moved out of the house. 
and we started early and that's that's where I am right now. It's a great you look really young for your kids you. to have moved out of the <laughs> Did anybody else have uh, we've had just about four or five of us doing most of the talking. Can we hear if there's anybody who's been holding back a question? Oh, and by the way, Brian, your 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 plane videos are awesome, dude. Um, when oh, I was in my private a couple of years ago, um, I, I've had it now for I think three years. You were one of the ones that I looked at, and uh, just plain silly, um, really, really brought me a ton of joy. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you so much. I'll just jump in here with a question. Sorry, I don't have my video turned on here. My camera is actually upside down. But nevertheless, um, uh, Brian, yeah, I've looked at a couple of your videos too. Great stuff. I mean, really, really fun. I appreciate that. Um, I am curious, though, you know, hearing you talk about this, I'm getting the impression that uh, you, know, you really kind of started it out for fun, um, you know, you're sort of doing it as a favor, so to speak. But I'm curious, um, have you found a way to actually monetize some of this stuff? And, and if so, do you have advice for somebody that wants to create videos, not necessarily humor, but just you know some kind of videos, a YouTube channel or something like that, that you've found that actually works? Yeah, I, I, I monetize. And so it, it's so tough. In, in aviation, well, I'll tell you my story. So um, I, do, I do monetize the channel. I don't like to bombard people with that. So as, if you have a, a YouTube channel, you can say, I want the little things to show at the bottom or advertisements over here. Some people do the skippable and non-skippable video ads. Um, I could probably make more money, but I take out these things called mid-roll ads, like in the middle of the video, like no one wants to stop their video to, to see an ad. Um, but I'll, I'll put the ones on at the beginning that you can skip after five seconds. So my, my channel right now is about 20,000 subscribers. Um, and there's several sources of income. So there's there's this, the lowest source of income for a YouTuber is advertising revenue. Um, I've had months where um, I get a check from Google for $800 and I've had months where it's $100. It's very unpredictable. It's based on time spent viewing your channel. Um, I know, you know, D Dan Milliken and I compare numbers and right now he's, he's doubling about what I'm, I am on that. And so, but I would say on an average month, full transparency, two to three hundred dollars, unless I, I have something that does really well and then the numbers go up. Or what will happen a lot of times is like with the airspace video, someone will share it with a flight club or something. And then it just YouTube says, oh, this is getting viewed again. And YouTube pushes it. Um, there's Patreon, which I, I never wanted to do the Patreon thing, um, but I had probably a couple times a month, people would ask me like, hey, how can we support you? And I'm like, no, nah, don't worry about it. And um, I, I went to the, the event in Kansas and someone was up there giving a speech about the importance of Patreon. And they said, you know, think about it as a tip jar. It's not, you're not, you're not saying I'm going to, I'm not going to do anything, but so I set up the Patreon and what I do is I literally, I have the Patreon, there's like $3 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, and kind of um, we'll do Zoom meetings with those folks. Um, I literally, like I said, I'm making a video about radio communication. What are some dumb things pilots do on the radio? And so I take their ideas and I add those to my video. And so try to try to become a little little my own little social media community with those groups. It's, it's a lot of fun. They seem to enjoy it. And um, it, I, I, I we we do bounce ideas off each other. It's, it's kind of like what we're doing here, um, where I, I wrote down the note about the ice and the snowman. Um, so that one, that's. That's another two or three hundred bucks a month ish, um, but it, it ebbs and flows because some people just come in and say, "Hey, you're great. I, here's twenty bucks. Thanks for the laughs, and then see you later." And that I'm very grateful. Um, the people, the people I know who are making a living at it, um, I don't want to say their names. There's, there's there's people I know who are making six figures a year just off the Patreon, um, and um, the. I, I would say once once you're around that hundred thousand subscriber mark, mark, you're you're probably making a living at it. Um, I know Josh Flowers; he's a friend of mine. Um, he I'm, I met him right after he graduated college, and I said, "What was your degree?" And he said, "Computer science." I said, "Mine too. What are you going to do?" And he goes, "Nothing. I don't have to." <laughs> like I hate you. I hate you so much for that. Um, 
but so, you know, it, that was probably when he was ar around the 120 mark. So the, the number one thing you can do really is working with other people who are doing it. Um, so like Dan and I work together. So a lot of our audience overlaps. Um, I've, I've gotten to meet some really great people and, you know, I, I flew with Kevin from 310 Pilot and after I, I flew with him, you know, a lot of his people came over to my channel. That, that's probably the fastest growth. The other thing, which is the hard part is consistency. And I, I hate saying this because the first time I heard it, I, I was like, there's no way. If you can put out a video every week, maybe every two weeks, but be consistent and release at the same time. I think the YouTube algorithm picks up on the fact that this is a consistent person because it's, it's all about trying to get YouTube to push the video. Um, the, social media is fairly saturated, especially in the aviation groups with people sharing their own content. And so I've, I don't really share my stuff on Facebook anymore. I, mean, I used to share it on Reddit because there's a pretty big aviation audience, but it's kind of gotten the point to where everyone's sharing YouTube videos and these things all the time and people are getting kind of tired of it. So um, having other people share your videos is great. <laughs> Um, but, um, the, the first thing is, and I will say this, the first thousand subscribers are the hardest. It, it took me two years to get a thousand. And then about eight months later, I was at 10,000. So there's that, that, that first little part that's really, really, you know, a, a challenge or whatever. But, um, so yeah, long story short, you can make, you can make a, a living at it. Um, my goal was for YouTube to pay for my flying. Um, so, you know, my, my hangar is $150 a month. So YouTube's covering that. Um, I, I'm not paying annuals and insurance and stuff with it yet, but it's, it's starting to help. Um, but if, if you're one of these, a great example, I don't know if you guys know who, uh, Ron, Juan Brown from Blanco Lirio is, he covers accidents. I, I don't want to do that, but there was nobody doing that. He did it. And within a year, that's his job. Like he was a, an airline guy. Um, so if you're, if you're different enough, doing something unique enough that people are interested in, absolutely, you, the sky's the limit. Um, so I, I, they're, 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 I'm, always, I'm the guy always looking for a secret. I've tried making ads for the channel and putting them on flight shops, you know, videos, and you, know, you can do stuff like that. There's, there's, it really is all about good content and make sure the videos are long because it's about time spent viewing so if, if you're making three minute videos youtube's not going to push it if you're making 10 to 15 minutes it's kind of the sweet spot um i could probably write a book on what not to do because i've tried everything just to see how it uh affects the the analytics um, but it really is about making a video where you teamed up with a couple of f-18s by accident and it was like the next day like like just you know stuff stuff that you think man this this really resonates with people. So um, I don't know. Long long rambling answer, but um, I, I, if you want to start a channel, I could probably I actually have a list of, of a big document I've given to people and said, here's a list of things not to do. Um, and it's it's a two page paper that I've, I've given to a lot of people because a lot of people come to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Can you help me? And I say, I can't tell you how to make it successful, but I can tell you how not to waste your time and and, and what what things that that you might think in your head, oh, this is going to do it, and it might not. So so thanks for the five-minute answer. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> I really appreciate your sharing all that, and I really appreciate the input. Yeah. You heard him, Marty. Uh, Brian's volunteered to uh, do our media on YouTube now. You bet. I'll do, I'll do all your money. Something like that. <laughs> Tell you what, Brian, we'll it's give you a free like CPA you membership if you do that for us. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Oh, well, that, that's the other thing is, is sponsorships. So um, I only have one sponsor now. I've had a couple other people that have asked to sponsor, but they're like, we just want you to do a 90 second discussion on our product in the middle of your video. And I'm going to drive people away, but Gold Seal has been very good to me. Um, and and they, um, I, I use their product. Um, I've passed my <laughs> instrument test twice using Gold Seal. And uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm I'll be pretty specific about people who who want to want to sponsor it. Um, so, but that that's that's another route to make make money. If you're doing something unique and they know you've got eyes on on you and they think you're going to grow, um, people will come up to you and say, "Hey, let's let's talk about what it would cost." And, and their only request was, "Hey, every once in a while, wear, wear a shirt with our logo and then just throw a logo on the screen for four seconds." And I, I, you know, I offered to do more, and they said, "No, we don't we don't want you making your audience mad by doing a five minute commercial on us." He said, "Just." Four seconds is all we ask, and so, okay.
Cool. Anybody else? All right. I've covered everything. <laughs> I told you, Dominic. I, I, I ran this. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'll look. I'll look. I'll look for you at Oshkosh this year. So, I'll be out there. Okay. Yeah, I'm going, and I'll probably. I may. I may put a little thing. So, one thing I like about YouTube is there's a tab called Community, and um, I'm, I'm not one of these big fancy aviation 101 people or whatever, but I'll, I'll put something on my community tab saying, hey, I'm going to be at the SOS tent Wednesday at 8 or whatever, and, and we'll get together and share stories and have drinks and people watch. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, Marty, over to you. Okay. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo Dominic's uh, words. Thanks a lot. And, you know, on behalf of the CPA for giving us an enjoyable evening Zoom seminar. Yes, I see people clapping hands virtually. Uh, we'll just do it, <laughs> being an old guy. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, you, you can keep in touch with Dominic. Maybe we'll have some other Zoom seminars you'd like to tune in on, and certainly you'd be welcome. So thanks a lot. And All right. Hope to see you here sometime in the not too distant future, flying in our beautiful mountains. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dominic, for, for reaching out to me. And thank you for catering to my interview preference style versus <laughs> me just giving a, a talk or something. This was, this was a lot of fun for me. I, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, inviting me to take part. I had a blast. Hey, Brian, uh, thank you so much for uh, yeah entertaining us. And uh, um, a couple friends of mine and I are going to head down to Arkansas at the end of the month. And uh, we'll be going up to... Uh, 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 Air Venture um, for that, and hope to meet you up there. All right, I will. Uh, I will. I will communicate with as many people as I can, uh, and we'll get to, we'll get some some group together to hang out. Okay, no worries, bud. We'll see you at the OSOS. Definitely. <laughs> that was good. Good presentation. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you very everybody much. for coming, giving us a little bit of your Monday night, and. Uh, There'll be another one in one month, so watch your emails, uh, CPA, and uh, you'll see the announcement for that. All right, guys. Thank you very much for my first time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Brian. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Good evening. Y'all fly safe.